So hello and welcome to this tutorial. Uh, it's going to be dealing with, uh, again, acid-base equilibria and more specifically how we are going to determine the pH at equivalence. That is the point in a titration where an acid and a base have completely reacted and the only thing that is remaining in the solution is a salt and water. So in this case we're going to take a look at a fairly common reaction, especially in high school labs or in introductory chemistry, and that is a neutralization reaction that occurs between acetic acid, which is a weak acid, and sodium hydroxide, which is a strong base. And we can see here that it is going to produce a salt. In this case, the salt is a uh, readily soluble salt of sodium acetate, and we have water being produced, again, typical of a neutralization reaction between an acid and a base. So as we can see here, we've been given the concentration and the volume of the acid in question, and we have been given the concentration of the base that is going to neutralize our acid. Now what we need to understand is that this is a neutralization reaction. That is, once this reaction is complete, no acid and no base remain in this reaction mixture. That is, we only have product. And you're going to notice that for this particular reaction, the way that it's expressed, even though we're going to analyze it ultimately as an equilibrium, there's a unidirectional arrow here. There is nothing left in this reaction mixture except for salt and water. So the only thing that can potentially impact the pH is either the salt or the water. So, if we take a look at this, we know right now that the information that we can determine, at least for the acid, is the number of moles. Now if we multiply our concentration times our volume, we are going to get a value of 2.50 times 10 to the negative 3 moles of the acid. Now what's important to note is that this is equivalence, meaning the acid and the base, in terms of their number of moles, are equivalent. If we notice in this particular reaction, which is fairly common again of neutralization reactions, there's a one-to-one -one ratio, specifically between the hydrogen and the hydroxide, but more so between the acid and the base. One mole of acid is needed to react with one mole of base and vice versa. So if we know the number of moles of acid in this particular reaction, we can determine that that was the number of moles of base required to neutralize this particular acid at this volume and this concentration. So what that allows us to do is figure out what volume of base was needed to neutralize this acid. So if we take a look then, we can figure out what the volume of base is going to be. We can take the number of moles of the base, 2.5 times 10 to the negative 3 moles. Notice again that that is the same as the number of moles of the acid. And we can divide by the concentration of the acid that we have in this case. And in doing so, we are going to arrive at a volume of 3.3 times 10 to the negative 2 liters. So the total volume of our reaction mixture then is going to be the volume of the acid that we had initially plus the volume of the base that we've just added. Now you will notice that I've gone to one more degree of precision than I should in this particular case, but we will factor that in when we come to our final calculation. Now why do we have to figure out the total volume here? Well ultimately the acid and the base have completely reacted. We have to remember that about an equivalence point question. The only thing that remains that could potentially impact the pH of water here are the presence of the ions. If we determine that one of these ions is strong enough to impact the pH of the solution, then we're ultimately going to have to figure out what the concentration of that ion is in the reaction mixture. That is, the mixture of the acid and the base, and therefore the addition of the two volumes of those solutions. So, what we're going to take a look at here is how to establish the concentration. Well, the first thing we need to know, since we know the total volume, is what are the number of moles that we are going to use? Well, again, take a look at the equation. It's a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one ratio between the acid, the base, and the salt. So whatever number of moles of acid we have, it's going to be equivalent to the number of moles of base required to neutralize it, but it's also going to be equivalent to the number of moles of salt produced. That is, the number of moles of salt in this particular question, so more specifically the sodium acetate, is going to be equal to the number of moles of acid that we calculated initially, which is equal to the number of moles of base required to neutralize the acid, and is therefore equal to the number of moles of salt produced in this 1 to 1 to 1 ratio. Utilizing this, we can figure out the concentration of the salt in the reaction mixture by taking the number of moles divided by the volume. And in doing so, we take our 2.5 times 10 to the negative 3 moles. We divide it by our total volume of 0 0.0583 liters. And we arrive at a concentration of 0 0.043 moles per liter. 
I guess I underrepresented the significant digits in the number of moles of the salt, uh, but ultimately it was going to be expressed to two significant digits anyway. So that's a good number of calculations, isn't it? But we are not done here yet. Remember, this is asking us to determine the pH. All we've done at this point is figure out the concentration of the salt that is in this reaction mixture. So now we have to analyze this a little further. That is, we have to take a look at the salt that's going to impact the pH. Now notice that the salt produced here, sodium acetate, is going to dissociate readily into sodium ions and acetate ions. And notice also that it does so in a 1 to 1 to 1 ratio. So if we take a look at this, we're going to notice that the sodium ion is the conjugate of a strong base, namely sodium hydroxide. And as a result of that, sodium is not going to impact the pH of our solution. However, the acetate ion is the conjugate of a weak acid. That is, it is the conjugate of acetic acid. So the acetate ion, therefore, could potentially act as a weak base in this scenario. So it's in fact going to be the acetate ion that we are going to analyze here. So since we know that we have a concentration of 0.043 moles per liter of the sodium acetate, we can make the conclusion, because of the 1 to 1 ratio, that that's also going to be the concentration of the acetate ion. So finally, here is our equilibrium expression. That is, we know that it's the acetate ion that is going to impact our pH, and since it is the conjugate of an acid, we know that it's going to act as a base. And we can verify this by putting together this equilibrium equation, and we can see that it in fact produces hydroxide ions. At this point, like every other equilibrium scenario we've analyzed, we can put together an ice table. So we know the initial concentration of the acetate ion. We will treat the initial concentration of the two product ions as zero. The only way this concentration can go to, is down. So there's our equilibrium concentration for the acetate ion. The only way that our product ion concentrations can go is up. And so there's a fairly characteristic ice table set up for a weak base or a weak acid analysis. Now the other thing that we have to realize is if we look at our table of values for Ka's and Kb's, we are not given the Kb of the acetate ion. That is, we have to determine it. So we can utilize the Ka of its conjugate in order to establish that. So if we're looking for the Kb of the acetate ion, we can take the Kw and divide it by the Ka of the conjugate, which is going to be acetic acid. And if we do that, we can see that we are going to arrive at a Kb of 5.6 times 10 to the negative 10. Now if we take a look at that Kb value, we will notice that it is fairly small. And anytime we see a really small Kb value, we can remember that we can perform a test to see if we can eliminate the need for that x. And remember, our test is always going to be our initial concentration over the K. In this case, it's going to be the Kb. And we are going to see our initial concentration of 0.043 and divide that by 5.6 times 10 to the negative 10. You know, that's an extremely small number in the denominator, and so that is going to be significantly greater than 500. That is, I'm not even going to go through that calculation. And since it's significantly greater than 500, or at least it would be, that means I can negate any change of the initial concentration that is not zero. So I can negate x again because x is going to be so small that it will not appreciably affect our initial or ultimately equilibrium concentration in this case of the acetate ion. So now it's just a matter of plugging all of my equilibrium values into my equilibrium expression. And in doing so, I am left with this, and now I'm just going to simplify. So I combine this calculation in two steps. I multiply the Kb by the initial concentration, and then I'm going to take the square root of those two values, or at least the product of those two values. Again, this is because x times x is going to give me x squared, and I want to simplify just for the value of x. And in doing so, I'm going to arrive at a value for x of 4.9 times 10 to the negative 6. Now we have to remember that this is the value for x, but it is also going to represent the concentration of the hydroxide ions. In this question, we are asked to calculate pH. Now remember, pH is the negative log of the hydronium ion concentration. So we could use our relationship between Kw, the hydroxide ion, and the hydronium ion to figure out what the concentration of the hydronium ion is, but I am going to calculate first the pOH, which is the negative log of the hydroxide ion concentration. So in this case, it's going to be the negative log of 4.9 times 10 to the negative 6.
And in performing this calculation, I'm going to find that I have a pOH of 5.31. Now that should not be surprising because it's acting as a weak base, so here I have a low pOH. And in calculating my pH, I'm going to subtract my pOH from 14. And what that's going to leave me with is a value of 8.69. And again, that should not be surprising. Here we have a pH that's between 8 and 9, which is fairly indicative of a weak base. Now, are we done? Uh, no. What we have to recognize here is that we need to pick an indicator for this particular pH. Now, if we take a look at a table of indicators like this, there are a couple of options. And we can see that between a pH of 8 and 9, we could pick thymol blue or we could pick phenolphthalein. And I suppose at this point, any one of those indicators would probably be appropriate. But if we were going to analyze this a little bit further, we would have to think about what's going on here. Initially, we had an acid, and now we are adding a base. So we need to think about what's happening to the pH over the course of this titration. Since we are starting with an acid, it's very likely that we are going to have our indicator in the acid first. And so as a result, our pH is going to be on the low end, that is certainly lower than 7. And as we add the base, it is going to increase in terms of its pH. So if we look at a table like this, what we're looking for is color change that occurs left to right and is going to change somewhere around 8.7. I suppose if we were using thymol blue as our indicator, that would be acceptable because we'd be looking at an endpoint where the indicator is changed to a green color. And if it went to blue, we'd know that we had gone too far. Now, if we're using phenolphthalein for this particular titration, that's acceptable too, because if we take a look at our pH of our equivalence point, we can see that it's about 8.7, so we would have to look for a transition from clear into a very light pink. If it goes into a darker pink, then we have over-titrated, as the case may be, so phenolphthalein or thymol blue would be an appropriate indicator to use here. So hopefully after watching this, you have an appreciation for the magnitude and the multitude of calculations that you have to go through in order to establish an appropriate indicator to select for an acid-base titration by analyzing the equivalence point of that acid-base titration. None of the calculations, if you look at them, are especially challenging. It's multiplication, division, uh, maybe some addition or subtraction when pH comes into play, but it's a matter of understanding each one of those steps and understanding the process. So it will take a few of these questions to practice, but I promise you, practice, while it may not make perfect, will certainly make this make a little bit more sense. Or at least, that's the hope. Thanks for watching.